Told Me, a podcast featuring ordinary women who have overcome and done extraordinary things. I'm your host, Farah Hadar. Joining me today is Susan Gold. Susan grew up in a home with brilliant parents who were rattled by addiction, alcoholism, and mental illness. Leaving the day after high school graduation, she found herself in New York City, matching celebrities to brands long before it was chic. Her work in New York eventually led her to Los Angeles, where she produced celebrity-focused interviews and segments for AMC, Bravo, and the Sundance Channel. Wanting to live her life to the fullest, Susan chose to face the remnants of her past and see how it was affecting her present. Susan, thank you for being here today. What struck me about your story was the highs and lows of it, right? Like you started off in this very difficult environment and then you just chose to like take off immediately, no support, et cetera. And you took off into NYC, which is a very competitive environment, as we all know, and really made something, made a name for yourself, did this new innovative thing. So I really want to start at the beginning. Like, what was your childhood like? Could you elaborate on that for us a little bit? Well, first, I just want to say what a privilege it is to be in your company. And I almost got teary eyed to be included in that group of women in your oh, intro. You. So thank you very much. But the childhood, yeah, I, <laughs> it's, sometimes it's hard to go back through that door. Right. Um it was very chaotic. First of all, I have incredible respect and love for my parents and the roles they were playing. Uh, they came from abuse and their parents came from abuse. It was hurt and damaged children, raising hurt and damaged children. Yeah. And each of my siblings have a very different experience growing up in that same household, which is kind of standard, um, but I find intriguing. Um, so I knew very early on that something was not right. Um, there was blame, shame, abuse of every type. There was not enough love to go around. And it was dog eat dog competition for what scraps there were. And I was really grateful to somehow intuitively know that something was awry, that I wasn't safe, and that I would have to eventually get out. Yeah. <laughs> and I used to I used to watch Barbara Walters on my beanbag chair in my belly on my basement, going, I want to go to New York City and I want to be like like that woman. Yeah. So I envied some of my friends who got to stay behind and marry their high school sweethearts and mm -hmm. remain in the town. But that morning after high school graduation came and it was my time to leave. I left at quarter to eight in the morning and I had a job at the Jersey Shore for the summer before I went out to Ohio for college. Um, and midway through college, an alumni came through and she explained what she was doing in New York City, which was arts management. And I'd never heard of it at the time. So I wrote her from the shore that next summer. And I said, I'd like to come intern for you a year from now. And she said, you're going to have to come this winter term. We need you. We have our first Broadway season we're producing wow. for a client. And back then it wasn't it wasn't standard fara to do internships as, as as a matter of fact it was kind of frowned upon you were supposed to stay in your track mm -hmm. you know and follow the trail um so i had to negotiate with the head of my department she sent me to the head of the entire school and i had to plea my case and that was actually maya lynn's dad maya lynn um, had just been awarded the vietnam war memorial project. Um, and I was really nervous with her dad, who was looking at me through horn rimmed spectacles, wondering why I was in his office. But I was, I was determined to get to New York City. And I did. I was 19. Uh -huh. And I was living in Greenwich Village on my own and experiencing all New York City had mostly on foot. Yeah. Um, and it was it was a huge privilege and it was terrifying, but I knew I was where I was supposed to be. You know, I got to tell you, I relate so much to your story. I'm the youngest of nine children. It's a very chaotic household. 
I grew up between Massachusetts and Beirut, Lebanon. So there was a civil war also going as well. Um, my parents were, I, I'm, I'm not going to compare them to yours because I don't, don't know the details, but my parents had, you know, their own fair share of, of, of trials and troubles. And, um, I kind of came to that same conclusion that this is, this is really not normal. Like what's not that there was anything necessarily so bad happening in it. I actually always say that one thing I will always give my parents credit for was that they were in this vicious generational cycle and it's not that they broke us out of it but they they nudged us far out enough that their kids were able to break out of it do you know what i mean like they were in it but they they kind of like like for the longest time i couldn't understand why we were never introduced to some of our uncles or something it's like oh they're far away or they're whatever but i was like oh that's why they didn't really like let us hang out with some of our cousins or some of our because they they knew that it was just probably not the best environment for us. Um, and top that, that we were often, you know, that we had fled the country when and I was born in the States and then we came back. And then it was all this kind of like there was a lot of different things. It was chaotic, it was definitely chaotic. So um, and like you, uh, you know, after graduating high school, I was like, I, I couldn't get out. Like I, I went to school um, for two years staying with my parents. And then at 19, I was like. I got to get out of here. Uh, This, uh, I don't foresee a future for myself. You get that, you hit that moment where you're like, I know that if I stay, it's not going to be good. Right? Like, I don't know if you had that moment, but I know that I definitely had that moment that if I stay here, I'm not going to make it. I so identify with that. And I'm so glad you shared some of your personal story. Mm -hmm. Um, And I knew there was kismet. I knew knew empathically (laughs) that there was a lot in common. But yeah, it does take bravery to step out of it, doesn't it? And that bravery has to repeat. I mean, it did for me. Um, It repeated again in adulthood. Um, But I, like you, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for what my parents delivered to me. Yeah. I can relate to that. Like I, they gave, they definitely gave me nuggets. There was a lot that they gave me, but it was, there were nuggets in it. Um, so, but let's go back to you. Um, so let's, you're in New York, you get this opportunity, which I always love when people have that kind of story where they reach out and suddenly that opportunity is there because I, I like to tell my kids it's not luck. It's people asking and then they get put in the right places. If you put yourself in the right places, luck suddenly seems to happen. But you get this beautiful opportunity. And then what happens then? I took full advantage of it and really got to see the arts side of downtown Manhattan. Um, And I was invited to work full time for that same agency management firm after college, but I wanted to work in the more glitzy side of the entertainment industry. I wanted to be in a skyscraper fair uh, uptown. (laughs) So I just asked questions. I just asked people who they knew that might know. I didn't know anybody in the, the mainstream entertainment industry. And I ended up at ICM, which is a large global talent agency. Mm Um, and I was uh, working as an assistant there and I wasn't making enough money and started personal training on the side. And Barbara Walters actually ended up being my client. <laughs> wow. So you say that you were matching celebrities to brands before mm-hmm. it was chic. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, I mean, celebrities have been doing endorsements for a long, long time, but now, you know, it's, there's a proliferation and it's all about influencers as well as mainstream celebrities. But um, I was great to have experience learning how to um, negotiate talent contracts. Um, The agent that I worked with left the agency, asked me to join him and we worked out of a studio apartment and I really got great training. But the man also had a serious sexual addiction and um, he launched out at me and I rang Barbara's doorbell at 7am the next morning and she said promptly, what is happening? And 
she obviously was a great interviewer and got it out of me. And she said, we're going to work together this morning and we're going to confront this man together. Wow. And I said, you know what? I, I think I got this one, <laughs> Barbara. It's okay. And I did confront him that day. And he said, do you have everything you need? And I said, yes. And he said, great, you're fired. Oh, wow. And Barbara actually offered me an assistantship but I couldn't even imagine working as an assistant. So with two and a half months of income in the bank and just having extricated myself from an abusive relationship where the gentleman held the purse strings, and I'm ashamed to admit that, but that was the truth. I was terrified that I would go back into that abusive relationship, but I decided that I really needed to follow that inner voice and I launched my own brokerage firm matching celebrities to brands before it was chic. Wow. And I was led to a deal where Donnie Deutsch, who's a huge entrepreneur and a great host, he's a bit of an icon now, but then he was running his dad's ad agency. He's like, I need Andy Warhol for my Pontiac client. You think you can get him? I'm like, I'll try. Uh, yeah. And I, I couldn't get anybody to answer the phone at the factory. So I literally took the subway down there and knocked on the door. And Andy's manager, Fred, said, come on back tomorrow and I'll let you talk to Andy. And he did. The next day, the double doors into the studio flew open and it was dark in there. And I was kind of scared to go in, but what was I going to do? And there was the platinum blonde hair going like in 17 directions with a pin spotlight coming down on it. And he's scribbling, you know, mm -hmm. and these three pugs are running around the studio with him. And he loves these pugs. They're tugging at his pants. He's picking them up like they're babies. He could care less while, why I'm in there and what I have to say. Finally, he looks up at me. And this is the first time he makes eye contact. And he said, now, really, why should I do this? And I just paused. And I said, because you can have the pugs in the shot with you. And he said, okay, you know, I'll do it. And, and that really launched, well, launched my career. Um, and that led me into producing, actually, for television and film and ultimately on to L.A., you know, I just want to back up for a moment and, and just make a couple of notes about that story, because I, I people sometimes ask me like how, you know, I've gotten my bakery on like the Today Show and I, I got, you know, on I spoke to Marcus Limonis once who, you know, does this business. And people always ask me like, oh, you they say, oh, you get so lucky. And I'm like, no, like that. That Instagram live with Marcus Limonis was like three years worth of work, right? Mm -hmm. It was three years of following him on social, emailing him. Like, I'll, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but we even sent him like a Valentine telegram once, like love our business. Like, you know, you have to be creative. You were like, I can't get anyone to pick up the phone. I'm going to show up and there's a value. I want, I want anyone who's listening to this. There's so much value in showing up. People can refuse a phone call easily. They can delete an email even easier. They can block you on text. But when you show up, someone's like, ah, they made the effort. Now I have to give them a chance, right? Like, have, have you found that to be true in your career? Well, certainly the piece where people think I'm lucky <laughs> and <laughs> I think there has been much serendipity mm -hmm. personally and professionally for me, but it takes bravery and it takes courage to put yourself out there repeatedly and to be willing to face rejection. And I don't know, maybe I'm just dumb blind, even in corporate settings. I didn't even, I didn't even give it a second thought i just like let's try this yeah. and it and it worked and and yeah people just viewed me like i was magical but honestly i was just doing the next right thing and not asking too many questions and not being really even taking into consideration how others would view me i mean especially in in the corporate setting yeah. i just was like s such a, a square peg in a round hole i did not fit yeah, I, I've never fit in corporate settings either. But I also want to point out, like, when he, when, when he said, why should I do this? You, without hesitation, like, look at what that took, right? You recognized what he loved. 
And you said you can have the pugs in the shot. You didn't say, oh, let me think about it. Let me clear it with the manager. And I don't know if they'll let you do this. And you just went out like you knew you had an instinctual knowing of what they would agree to and what would motivate him to do it. Right. Like where you could find that overlap of their interests. And you just offered. And I, I think we as women actually have that capability, that intuitive capability. And I intuited to stay safe growing up. I was incredibly empathic. I still am. And I was telepathic. I could hear thoughts when I was, when I was younger, that's actually coming back more and more, but I, I can get into somebody's being and understand they're a human being regardless of their rank and stature within culture and society. And they're putting their pants legs on one at a time. And he had to do it in public, just like many others that I've been privileged to have the opportunity to work with. And just understanding that that, and having compassion for one's humanity Mm -hmm. has really served me. And I don't mean to sound self-serving in that. I just mean that that compassion piece is pivotal. Yeah. I, I've always found that people that grew up in chaotic environments, it's about like reading a room, being able to come in and read a room and know people's different interests and how you can get them to connect. That's It's a real skill. If you don't have it, you can cultivate it 100%. But it takes and it has served, it served me well a lot in my life, I will say, and it obviously served you well. So you're in NYC. Let's go back. When did you start thinking a little bit about your background and how it was affecting your future? You know, you mentioned an abusive relationship. I'm assuming that was part, you know, maybe motivated somewhat by your past or what you had grown up being used to and finding acceptable in relationships. What was your kind of moment of truth that you had? So there were clearly remnants of my past manifesting and abusive relationships, drama, lying when it was easier to tell the truth, walking around required a baseball hat, sunglasses and headphones. Um, I took a slug from a wine jug to ask for a raise at work. That was, and my my friends were becoming more and more fair weathered friends. Mm -hmm. There were seedier environments I was (laughs) frequenting. Something is wrong with this picture, Susan. And finally, I asked a friend for help who referred me to a therapist. And in my family, you didn't pay somebody to listen to your problems, let alone expose any of your problems. But I was willing to be willing. And I give myself a lot of credit. I followed through. I walked into that office. And the first thing that therapists started talking about was, was there drinking in my family? Was there alcoholism? How much did my father drink? Did I drink? And I'm like, I'm happy when I drink. What does my dad's drinking have to do with anything? You know, these, these problems I'm having, I don't understand. So I addressed alcoholism. He was very, very clever. He had me go to meetings to study my father's issue and other meetings to understand how alcoholism affected me as a child growing up within that environment. And I went to rooms where people were sharing like with aplomb exactly what had happened in my home and feelings I had experienced. And I was stunned, I mean, to let this stuff out of the closet. So getting clean and sober was the first thing that had to happen for me to have an even playing field. And then about four and a half years into that, I got into a business deal where I was playing the same role that I had between my parents. Uh, There were two parties. I was in the center trying to broker both parties together. And it kicked up so much from my past that I went into clinical depression and split out of my body. And luckily, I had friends around me who noted it, and they got me to my first treatment center. So I hadn't gone to a rehab to get clean. But at four and a half years sober, I went to my first one. And there I learned about clinical depression. And um, I fought it, but I used medication for 10 years off and on 
to understand clinical depression and come to a point where I could actually do the work to clean up some of the trauma from the past and understand the points that I would get to as I was bottoming towards that depression again. And I, I reached a point where I didn't need the medication any longer. I knew what the, what the flags were and I could put the, I could plug the dike before it exploded, um, so to speak. Yeah. I, I, I have so a tremendous amount of respect for that, by the way. Tremendous, because I think it's it's hard. I think therapy is hard. If you do it right, therapy is very hard. If you're in therapy and it's easy, you're not with the right therapist, right? Like therapy is hard. And to grow up in an environment that didn't, I, I did have one blessing where my one of my sisters, who's wonderful, is actually, actually was doing her PhD in psychology. She's now a trained marital and children therapist. And I always tell her I get my therapy for free. She's like, I can't be your therapist. I'm like, but you are. And... <laughs> You know, so, but I, I definitely agree with you. Like the idea of therapy is very difficult in many families, especially families that really don't want their things examined, right? That maybe the therapist is like, oh, this is just going to be like, not good for us. So thank you. So it sounds like it wasn't like one moment of truth. You didn't have this aha moment. It was like things were going bad and you kind of sought a little bit of help and then you just kept digging deeper and deeper that be an accurate representation? And and that's an accurate representation of my entire adult life. It's been a continuation and a process and the universe presenting for me what I could not present all on my own. It's just one serendipitous experience after another. And I've just been very grateful and willing to accept help with each one that's come my way. Now, there's something that that it, it kind of piques my curiosity about you, which is I know that you got into fitness because you were like, OK, I'm going to get become as a, kind of like a side hustle to make more money. But since then, you've been in Ironman competitions, correct? So I was first a marathoner, Farah, yeah. and then I was becoming so injured from just all of the running training. Get this. I thought, oh, I'll just spread it out over three sports that way. It'll, <laughs> Yeah, there, there's some thinking for you. Yeah. Um, and I thought I'd be a triathlete for life. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Loved it. Um, and then the injuries got too great there. So I decided I'm going to focus on master swimming. And within four years after working with gold medal Olympians and world-class swimmers, I actually, um, within four years had a national ranking as a master swimmer and was grateful, but I was training deep into adulthood, like an NC2A athlete. I would jump in the pool at 5.30 a.m. And sometimes that was freezing cold, like California sounds warm, but it could be 38 degrees on deck and 76 in the pool. And I'd just be blue because I had like zero body fat then. And then I'd go throw kettlebells at the gym and then I'd go into hot yoga and I'd be walking the dog three times a day. I mean, it was insane. And here it was, another mask that needed to fall because I was using this endurance sport and exercise to create a false persona. Mm. Self-worth, self-value, compassion came at a brutal cost. So, um, again, the universe did for me what I could not do for myself. And I went from all of that to not being able to walk around my block without utter agony. So you got injured because I was, I was curious to see if the, the physicality of it was helping you sometimes, you know, people find it meditative or, or a way to get out of their head, but I can totally identify with the need for achievement as a as a indication of self-worth 100 percent, i'm like that it's something i struggle with daily um so what happened you you got injured yeah i had a serious hip impingement and i knew at my age if i tried western medicine they'd just say 
insert titanium, you know, yeah. pass go. So I searched for three years and finally found modalities that worked. And I'm grateful to say today, you know, I can hike, I can walk, I'm not in chronic pain. Um, I can, I just started, you know, throwing kettlebells a tiny bit, you know, and I do yoga, um, but I'm doing it from a, a space of self-care rather than numbing and achievement. And that's a profound differentiation that I'm so grateful for. Yeah, I always find it interesting when people say like, don't do this or don't do that because of whatever. And I'm just like, it really, I, I never find an action is really the problem, whether you exercise or not, et cetera. It's really the, the meaning we attach to the action. Do you know what I mean? Like that's if, so true. If you're if you're going and and doing this Iron Man for yourself and it's about you, that's not unhealthy. You know what I mean? But if you're going and the only reason you're doing it and you're brutalizing your body just because you want to prove that you you're worth something, then that's that's not great. <laughs> like as we've no. discussed. So how did that realization come for you? Was it after you got injured or was it, how did that realization come to you? Well, I knew it was wearing down. I mean, I had, I had been invited to LA from New York and I thought it was for an amazing job opportunity and it was, but it was actually to meet one of my greatest teachers. I actually refer to him as a guru. It was the man who had become my ex-husband. And I thought I had met my Prince Charming and we were in a relationship for many years and had a son together. But ultimately what was happening was I was carrying more and more of the weight. Mm -hmm. And he always seemed dreamy. He seemed right out of the movies in Hollywood. And I was actually producing a show for AMC at the time, and he was my expert. He was brilliant on camera and an idiot savant when it came to anything Hollywood, Golden Age related. And I thought, wow, he's almost living like he's out of a movie. And ultimately, I discovered he was. He had a horrible upbringing he never addressed, um, and he had created a false persona. And... Um, I, I wanted my marriage to last, but the expiration date was way past due and I knew it, but I had such a fear of abandonment. I mean, my friends used to say, you're so powerful. You're so accomplished. I had bought a home for our family. I was maintaining it. I was earning, I was working from home. I was just making it happen. And it was also draining and I didn't feel that power. Farah inside my body inside I was a codependent mess and I tried to make him accountable through a biz business instrument a postnuptial agreement we got to the last point and I thought oh my god our marriage is going to be saved thank god and his eyes in the session went into those lizard like cold slits and he folded his arms and he said I'm hiring an attorney and I'm filing filing for divorce and that little angelic voice on my shoulder said, yeah, we're doing for you what you can't do for yourself. And it was one calendar year, Farah, of living in the same home, that same home that I had bought. And he took up residence in the master bedroom. I was in a partial conversion in our garage on a mattress on the floor. And that's the symbol for that relationship. That is the metaphor. And that's what I was allowing. And that's what I felt worthy of. Yeah. And it took that kind of billboard to fall on my head to really wake me up. And it was perfect storm. All my long time work as a meditator, all my endurance sport, all my abilities in work and negotiation, it all came into play to get through that year 
And I believe he may have narcissistic tendencies. Let's just put it that way. And the way to divorce one is no contact. So I literally held no contact for a year, no eye contact. Everything was in writing and it was short. And that continued when we shared custody of our son, all in writing, very short. And it worked. And in, in a year, I wrote him his six-figure check and he could move on to his next source of supply. And I am profoundly grateful for that lesson because it has woken me up to my own power and I have compassion for who he is to have to live in that regard and who I am to stand up in truth and integrity to walk through that and to say no more for me. I wish you well on your way, no more. And my life has, has profoundly shifted from, from that point forward. That's such an amazing take. You know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people about divorce and the ability to walk away from it and just have compassion for both parties. I think it's so freeing. The people that I've talked to that have not had compassion for their partner or pre ex-partner, um, they're just stuck in it. And they're stuck in it and they may move on and they may have other relationships, but it's always there, especially if they share children, because you, you you have to keep in contact with that person. And if if you can't get to a place where you can not not love them or anything, but just detach from them, realize that it's, you know, you had compassion for they were, but you're no longer together. It, it's it makes it so difficult. And unfortunately, it makes the kids life really difficult, too. So thank you for that. Um, you know, would you say that was the spiritual truth that was thrust upon you? Or was there another one that you wanted to share with us? <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just slip another one out quickly, because I'd Absolutely. love to give listeners as much as we can. So I always heard that truth when you point one finger out, three come back at you. Mm -hmm. And I, there is truth in that. But I want to say as an empath in a narcissistic relationship, that's a very dangerous spiritual truth because I needed <laughs> to point that finger out and I needed to point three fingers back to allow myself to stand up in truth and not shame myself. And why can't I be more giving? Why can't I be less stingy? You know, like, like just carrying blame and shame and responsibility that does not belong to me. Yeah, that's, oh, that's tough. <laughs> I have so much empathy for that. I really do. It's um, just, especially when you're someone, I think that you mentioned, you're someone who values yourself on your achievements and, on um, you know, the things, the accomplishments that you have. So marriage can sometimes feel like an accomplishment. Like we've been together for X amount of years. And, and now what does it say that you couldn't make it work, right? To your own self-worth. And I think that's incredibly difficult to kind of overcome. It's over. It's incredibly difficult for everyone. But if you're someone who like sees the prism of your identity through accomplishment, it can be really even that much harder. Does that make sense? Oh, completely makes sense. Well, Susan, now I get to ask you the question that I ask all my guests, which is what is a weird habit or ritual you have that makes your life more joyful? I love this question and I was hoping that I was going to get it. I was like, oh, maybe she won't ask me. Okay. So, you know, when you're a little kid and you go in the center of the room and you put your arms out and you start spinning, you do mm -hmm. turns and turn. I love to do that. <laughs> it makes me so happy. <laughs> I love that. I love that because, you know, I always, um, it's funny, like I have a niece and my niece is only five years younger than me. And she always reminds me of a time. She's like, my earliest memory of you is you spinning around a room with this big, big dress and you, you made it float and everyone was so happy. It was like, that's her first memory of me. And I'm like, you know what? I really need to keep that childhood glee going because is there anything more perfect than when you're in that moment as a kid? Yeah, no, not quite. No, I think, yeah, I think that's the magic. And I've always kept that alive. I knew I needed to, to, to walk the walk here on this earthly planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Susan, I'm so glad that you've kept it alive and I'm so glad that you've shared your story with us. It was a pleasure having you. And if you're out there and you'd like to hear more from Susan, you can visit her website at www.susangold.us. I know it's supposed to be us, but I like the dot us more, um, where you can find a few pages of her new book and a way to connect with her personally, as well keep uh, as well as being kept updated on events. All links, as always, in the show notes below. And I'd love to hear from you about this episode. What is a spiritual truth that was thrust upon you? Hit me up on Instagram or Facebook at Farah Hadar. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you'll get notified when a new next episode is available. Also, I'm giving away a PDF of some of the best quotes we've had on the show. Beautifully designed to print and journal your thoughts. Email me at farah at farahadar.com and title it quotes. Talk to you soon. Till then, chase your happy. Mm-hmm.